process of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling directed at achieving organizational goals. Because of the universality of management as a process and its time-tested applicability, the lecture will adopt the process view of management. And this is what managers do. Managers plan, they organize, they lead, and they control in order to achieve organizational objectives. But to perform these managerial roles, uh, portions very efficiently and effectively, he must acquire some basic skills and play some necessary roles in the organization. There are three skills that are important that managers should play. You have the technical skill, you have the human skill, and you have the, uh, the conceptual skill. The technical skill is the ability to use knowledge, methods, techniques, equipment to the perform for the performance of specific tasks, which is really acquired through training, on-the-job training, education, and experience. Human skill is the ability and enjoyment in working with and through people that requires understanding of motivation, leadership, and communication. These are the interpersonal skills. Conceptual skill is the ability to understand the organization, how different operations interface with each other and feeds into the organization. And the reason why we do transfer, you see, in mentoring, in making sure that the person moves to the highest level, you have to move them from one department to the other to study the department and know the relationship, the interrelationship that exists between the department and how all these interrelationships feed into the entire organization. The amount of technical skill that is required varies from level to level. So is conceptual skill. At the lower level, we need more of technical skill because it is here that a manager, he needs to know what is happening. Otherwise, if there is sabotage, the organization will be in trouble. So he also has needs it so that he can train and supervise his subordinates. Then we have the conceptual skill. This skill is required to formulate policies, strategic decisions, strategic decisions, strategic management issues. They need to formulate all these things. So it is required that at that level, it's a high level, it's for top management. And so we expect that you require it more at the top management level. But then the human skill, is that a manager that has human skill must have the feeling, that's empathy, fellow feelings toward others. He is such a person that does not bully on his staff. He is such a person that when a staff makes mistakes and you know, consistently, he is not interested. He wants to know why such mistakes have been made and why so that he'll be able to predict and correct such mistakes in future. And then, by so doing, he'll be able to influence his behavior. And that is the reason why it is said that it is the most important skill that is required. And in fact, Rockefeller, 1966, said, I would pay more for the ability to deal with people than any other ability under the sun. So the most important skill is the ability to get along with people. So it is not whether you have PID in human relations. No. People who have that skill, you don't need any person to know that they have the skill. Then there are some expectations. Certain things that managers are expected to do. These expectations are called managerial roles. And the managerial roles have been categorized into three. You have interpersonal role, you have the information.
conventional role, and then you have the decisional role. These roles are further subdivided. The, the interfacial role has to do with figurehead role, leader role, and liaison role. Informational role, monitor, monitor role, disseminator role, and spokesperson role. Then decisional role. It, it has to do with resource allocator role, negotiator role, entrepreneurial role, and disturbance handler role. We don't have time. Otherwise, we should have explained all these things so that you know how important they are. But one thing I want to tell you, that all these roles must be played in an organization. There must be someone who should be able to play this role. Any, any, if there's any way that any of this role is not played, then the organization is in crisis. And that's why we have so many money-made crises everywhere. Because you have some roles that are not being played by people in the organization. Style. Vice Chancellor, there is a thin line between style, fashion, and management fact. What is a style? It's simply a basic and distinctive mode of expression appearing in the field of any human endeavor. They appear in homes. They appear in clothing. They appear in Betiru, in, Be, in, Babi, in Babi Salon. They appear in art. So you see, even in your dressing, the haircut, you have styles. One event, the love of generation, passing in and out as both. They have a couple, it has a couple, a cycle, showing several periods of renewed interest. Examples are boyfriend jeans, girlfriend jeans, mom jeans. If I'm the first time I cited this, I said, come, are these people mad? That was my response. But you see, you see what marketers do, they use the crazy things to make people to buy. And so once people adopt it, then it becomes a fashion. Now, fashion. Fashion is a currently accepted or popular style. They have short life, life cycle. They shift rapidly. Examples are mini skirts, cargo pants, crop, crop out cuts, crop cuts, leather pants, waistcoat, and labu. I remember in the secondary school, the only trouble I had was, was a labu. And guess what? I had to borrow a slipper to wear it and take photographs. Labu. If I describe it, I'm sure most of you will not you will understand what we mean by labu. Now, fashions, they tend to grow slowly. They remain popular for a while and then decline. See OB, obedient, obedient movement. You see the way it started. It started gradually, gradually, gradually. Before you know it, 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 has, been, it has diffused. Both the elderly and the young ones started being obedient. That is a fashion. So there was a time obedience became a fashion in Nigeria. Facts. Any fashion that comes quickly into public view and is accepted with great zeal, peaks early and declines very fast, is a fad. They are unpredictable. They are short-lived. And they may be without social, political, or economic significance. It could be a practice followed for a time with exaggerated zeal. It's a craze for something, a short time, when there is exaggerated zeal for a particular idea or practice. Fads are widely accepted, innovative interventions into organizations practices designed to improve some aspects of performance. You see, every person hates beavers. We hate beavers, we hate iron, because it was expected to change the course of things concerning ringing. And every person had the faith that it, it would change. This is exactly what we mean by fad. Fads are expected. There are innovations that are expected to change the narratives. 
Five, they involve Ito Manime practices. You see, when they go to, when fast continue for a long time, it becomes a practice. But if they are not accepted, it becomes a failure. So fast can be a practice or it becomes a failure. But let, not all management fast or innovations are facts. So you can have so many innovations. But some of them quickly become accepted into the system. And so they are not facts. So they become really accepted and diffuse rapidly through institutional network to become a certain part of the system. The role of Maneme Guru in the provision of Maneme Fads. You see, who are Maneme Gurus? They are thinkers. They are practitioners. Opinion leaders. They are intellectual, experienced. They have opinions that have influence on business managers. And they have become a well-known figure as a result. Their publications attract a large number of pricing manage managers, paying high fees at conferences and seminars. So wherever they are, managers are ready to go there. They are ready to pay any amount in order to receive lectures from them. They command high fees for attendance at seminars where they convey their ideas to senior managers. They present big ideas through a, charis a charismatic performance and dancing. Maybe I should have danced like the way he dances in uh, etymology. <laughs> but here, we are business practitioners. We, if you start dancing, before you know it, you'll be bleeding. So you are not expected to dance you have to, you mean, you know you are in a war front. And therefore, not dancing. But we laugh. Even as you laugh, principled. Principled laughter. So you laugh. So I am an example. I'm a laughing professor. Managers in the audience take away these ideas and adapt them in their own organizations. Management gurus make great contribution in, and innovation. Please, I am trying to, okay. Yeah, we need water for lot of Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you can put it on. Uh. This is uh, of particular importance is the supply of manima fashion. Uh, of particular importance in the supply of manima fashion is the role of the manima guru. We have about three kinds of manima guru. The academic guru. These are seasoned academics. And they are from well-known educational institutions. They, are, they develop and popularize their ideas on some aspects of management. Examples are, we have so many examples, but I will just give three here. Michael Porter, Harry Misbeck, and Kenneth Blanchard. The consultant guru, these are senior professionals, prestigious firms that, are, that have established a reputation for creativity in particular fields. Example, what Peter, Peters and Waterman, Edwards Demi in quality, in, in quality management, Peter Drucker, and the consulting firm of boasting and consulting group. Then we have the hero manager, a senior executive who has committed his or her thoughts in print. But his sources, his authority 
comes from apparent sources that he has recorded. You see, Donald Trump is one of them. But unfortunately, he has allowed politics to destroy his management image. Their opinion leaders, they sell their talk and communicate many many ideas. And when the past are no longer beneficial, they abandon them. Do you see how selfish they are? Self-interest. They're interested in what they can get. So when they are publishing your, your books, it is not because they like you. It is because of what they want to get. Anytime your book is no more selling, they will leave you with your book. That is how they are. Opinion leaders. We have fans that have failed. We have quality circles, total quality management, self-management. There are so many. I may not be able to list them here. But if you go to my lecture note, you see that I wrote about five of them. So you need the lecture note to see their benefits and why they should not be neglected in a hurry. Then we have Blue Ocean Strategy. Blue Ocean Strategy is not a fad. It came in as a fad, an innovation. But it has two years of time. As we talk, it has, it's now more than 20, 22 years, and people are still using it for, for consultancy. People are borrowing ideas. And I want to tell you, if you are just starting your business, you need the blue, the blue ocean strategy. For those people who want to enter into new businesses, especially small scale businesses, you need blue ocean strategy. Then what is blue ocean strategy? It is adopted when a company simultaneously pursues the strategy of differentiation and low cost in order to open up new markets and create new demand. Blue oceans are the, are the are all the industries not in existence today. You have industries that are not in existence. So you need to go to that industry. Blue oceans, yeah, strategic will need to create the demand rather than fight for a share in the market. You see, as a small business, I wonder how you can compete with very large business. They will swallow you up. So what do you do? You look for a niche a marketing niche or an environmental niche, a place to hide and do your business and succeed. The market has great potential, but, uh, the, but it is not exploited. People are not going there because it doesn't make sense to go there. It is based on the belief that in order to win the future, companies must stop competing with each other. How is that possible? You are, you are in the same business and you, you are not to compete with each other. But this is exactly the assumption. The only way to beat competition is to stop trying to beat the competition. I want to tell you that we have the Red Ocean. The Red Ocean consists of industries in existence today with known market and demand. Competition rules are set. Companies try to outperform each other. This is the real scenario that we know of. There is cultural competition in the Red Ocean in order to grab a large chunk of the existing market and demand. Industrial attractiveness is very high, making the market crowded. Profits are reduced and growth is reduced also. Products become commodities. Competition is bloody. And that's why we call it Red Oceans. Here you have whales. They are ready to swallow you. So what must you do? You must swim out of the Red Ocean into what? The, the uh, Blue Ocean. Because when you get to the Blue Ocean, you are safe. Then the human factor. This is the core of the entire work. Now, I, I looked around and I discovered that human factor is not well spoken of. So many money-made theories, so many things, but no emphasis is not on the human factor. 
And I now said, let me set the ball rolling by introducing this human factor. Now, I have already told us what the human factor is. It has to do with the behavioral side of human beings in the organization. Is a lack of fit between the human element of the former and systematized element and systematized element found in management system. The human factor is seen in both marketing, we call it generic, generic functions of management. We see it in the generic functions of management, we see it in the functional aspects of management. But then it refers to all individual characteristics that affect original processes and techniques. They are the behavioral side of management that affect performance. These are human limitations and strengths that have been expressed in management and organization. They are the private agendas of people in organization. We have it in planning. So how is it replicated? How is this seen in planning? Now, the human factor, they are seen as personalities, preferences, and values, and very critical in the success, efficiency, and effectiveness of plans. In planning, the choice of strategy is a product of human factor. According to Yaren Oya, 2005, the formulation of objectives, strategies, policies are a reflection of the desires, preferences, values of the planner. The human factor cannot be eliminated from effective planning because man has limitless, has limitless thinking ability. The human factor is, a cru is crucial in the effectiveness of, of policy. The ability, skills, intelligence, leadership styles of managers determine the effectiveness of the communication of policy. When you want to communicate policy, there is the human factor. Changes in policies require ability and knowledge of when changes should occur, which depends Strategy is a projection of the personal values and preferences of the decision maker. The personal desires, aspirations, and needs of top management do play a role in the formulation of policy. In planning, forecasting the future requires personal judgment, forecasting skills, abilities, and perception. The experience of the planner is also very important in reducing the error term. All these are human issues. Thus, the success and effectiveness of forecasting can be said to depend on the human factor. In succession, in succession planning, there is also human element. 
the most hiring and promotion decisions, executive often overvalued certain traits and skills while other, other looking attributes that really made leaders effective. They made decisions that are based on their beliefs, interests, values, and preferences. Some believe in teamwork. They look at hands-on coaching, dynamic public speaking, raw ambition, consensus, similarity. You see, they just believe that people who have these attributes are the ones that should succeed. But that is what makes it, we call it a trap, a leadership trap. It's a leadership trap because it makes leaders to select people who will fail to be effective. Then the human factor in leading. There is no way we can separate the choice of the most sensible economic strategy for a company from the personal values of those who make the decision. You see, you cannot separate the personal uh, the, the decision of each person from his values. Leaders and strategists do not look exclusively at what company can do and might do. They are heavily influenced by what they personally want to do. Thus, in examining strategic alternatives, we must consider the preferences of the leader and the values of other decision makers who must assent to or contribute to the strategy if it is to be successful and effective. In resource allocation, the preference of the chief executive are reflected in the way resources are allocated. It therefore becomes important that strategic business units, divisions, departments, department heads present their demands in line with such preferences or create interest in the dominant strategies for their demands so that resources can be attracted easily. There are times when leaders take decisions we look economically nonsensical in the sense that it has no Nonsensical in the sense that it has no rational economic benefit. So choices are due to their personal interests, preferences, and values. This is sir. I hope we see the nuances, not from the presenter, but from the system. So I may beg for some extra minutes. Please pardon me. Thank you, sir. You see, it is this that possibly explains why Buhari will construct railway, railway line to Niger Republic. He could not have been on econom for economic reasons, but his political reasons, personal preference, and his interest. Because there is nothing we are going to gain from a railway from Nigeria to Daura to Uje. What? No, no gain. The, do the donation of fleets of vehicles to Niger Republic, when Nigeria was experiencing economic problems, could also be attributed to his personal preference. Similarly, pro former President Babagida committed huge resources, human, material, and financial, to pro prosecute the Liberian war in defense of his friend, President Doe, when there were no practical economic benefits to be gained from such wars. The losses sustained from that decision were huge. Even though Buhari acknowledges that Nigeria, in reality, has been a victim of two types of failures. Failure to produce a system of governance that inspires confidence in his people, and the failure to install a government that effectively tackles the problems of economic development with demonstrable vision. Almost at two, 2019, page 14. His administration does not walk the talk. For instance, the issues of men have always been handled with king gloves. He has shown partiality in issues that have to do with his kinsmen. There is no way that they are like the integration of Boko Haram captured fighters or prisoners of war 
in the Nigeria, he told the Nigeria army, will be said to be in the national interest. It is his personal interest. The question is to what extent? In the choice of leadership style, emotions are reflected. Depending on their interest, their perception and, emo and emotions, leaders may choose to be either democratic or autocratic. If a leader, if a leader perceives somebody to be mature, he or she may adopt autocratic leadership. Appointment to committee could also be based on internal politics, issues of loyalty, obedience and relationship come to the fore. Most strategic choices are based on consensus building, bargaining, and influence processes. Vice Chancellor, sir, in motivating workers, understanding what motivates them is important, and knowing what incentives to give is equally important. This depends on the capability, experience, and skills of leaders, personal judgment, beliefs, and leadership perception. What view a leader holds about their subordinate will inform his motivational style. For instance, it will be a human failing for a leader whose subordinate have satisfied physiological needs and safety needs to hold the view that workers are, um, are ambitious, do not have the capacity for creativity, and how to be how to be standardly controlled, directed, and coerced. To perceive such subordinates as immature, irresponsible, and unreliable would be a wrong judgment. The decision to create a, a harmonious or hostile working environment depends on the leadership style, personal judgment, beliefs, and interests of the leader. It also depends on how emotionally intelligent a leader may be. Even the decision to have a motivated workforce is a human element in management. Why will a leader overburden a worker who is found to be efficient and effective, thereby leading to burnout by, uh, by excessively utilizing his services, while there are so many other subordinates who can do the same work even better when given the opportunity? My answer is simply the human factor. Another area where human factor plays a vital role is communication. The organization has to be made known. These new products also have to be made known, especially at the introductory and growth stages of the product life cycle. There is need to create awareness about the organization and its product. Making a huge advertising investment is a, a key leadership decision. The return from such investment cannot be quantified in monetary terms only. The long-run effects will be substantial. Even the company's reputation will be great. It appears to me that a leader who is not interested in advertising is moving the organization in the wrong direction. Such organization may not be competitive in the marketplace. Spending on consultants to sell your image and products when the organization has imbued capab capabilities and capacity seems to me to be a complete waste of scarce resources and can turn leaders in the industry to follow us. It amounts to giving the consultants huge profits which they do not necessarily earn. Vice Chancellor, sir, a one-man ambition has kept the political environment unsettled. The trading, a milocon, it is my turn, has not only turned elections into war in the business political environment, it has brought into the fore the misuse of power, both, fin both financial and material. Backed by the state and having access to financial resources, the president-elect bulldozed his way using INEC to manipulate votes in his favor, which has engendered crisis of some sort. It is generally believed that this is one of the mo most flawed elections Nigeria has ever witnessed, with assurances by INEC that Beavers and IREF will perform magic and give Nigeria the fairest, the freest, fairest, and credible elections people have desired, and raising people's hope, INEC and its tools failed miserably, woefully. The failure was as a result of the human factor. Bribery, corruption, the misuse of power, self-interest, leadership preferences, human idiosyncrasies were, play, were seen playing their unfettered role in 2023 elections. People do not seem to have faith in the UGI anymore, not only because of past judgment, which have brought the cause into this refuge, but also because people believe and sincerely too, 
that the ruling party and the president-elect have brought have brought over the judiciary. The human factor, human factor in controlling, there is need to compare set of judges with actual performance. Now, the question that I want to ask is to what extent do we allow the human factor? Do we continue to allow the human factor? Do we continue to allow the human factor? Now the question is, so long as the human factor does not cause catastrophic failure to the organization, so long do we allow human factor. And so, it is necessary for all, for every decision maker to weigh his or her, or his or her, uh, to weigh his or her decisions and see whether it is effective, whether it will affect the, whether it will affect the organization negatively. And if it does not, then the leader should not go ahead. Conclusion. Vice Chancellor, sir, I have attempted in this lecture to examine the role of human factor in management and its fast, and believe that human factor is very critical in managing and in the establishment of management fast. None of the managerial functions can be carried out without human factor coming into play. Human idiosyncrasies are witnessed in management decisions and management techniques and interventions. Personality, capability, skills, experience, Personal judgment, all these, we have listed them before, they are human factors, but they are very fundamental in ensuring effective management. Management first are likely to remain as long as managerial issues continue to steer organizations in the face and as different organizations, organizational problems and opportunities are experienced. So management first may be accepted and become part of the organizational system. The lecture believes that in the choice of strategic alternative, the preferences of the leader, the values of other decision makers who must assent to or contribute to the strategy is key if the strategy is to be successful and effective. In resource allocation, the choice of leadership style, motivating workers and communicating the human factor is critical. The success and effectiveness of planning, policies, communication of policies, decision making, forecasting can be said to depend on the human factor. So long as our personal values, preference and interests do not create catastrophic failure to our organization. So long do we allow the human factor. The decision maker should weigh his or her values, preference, and interest against goals of the organization. And where there is conflict, organizational goals should take priority. Therefore, human factor should be moderated to avoid organizational failure. So this is my, my point, that you have to moderate the use of human failure, of, of, of human factor in organization. Management literature is replete with various management facts, some of which have turned to principles and theories because they were universally accepted and have stood the test of time, such as the 14 principles of management by Henry Fayo and the scientific management by Frederick Winslow Taylor, Theory S, and Theory Y, to mention just a few. There are some facts which are faded. The following facts are faded. We have the management by objectives, we have quality. We have total quality management, we have quality circles, we have self-management team, team groups, and so on and so forth. Even though they have paid them, management can still have recourse to them. Recommendations. Managers of institutions and organizations should cultivate a culture of motivating their staff. Motivation in form of non-monetary rewards may just be the tool that may bring the best out of your staff because it boosts their morale. Common phrases such as letters of commendation to staff, that letters of commendation to staff can instill in such staff recognition that he that focus on helping managers and leaders in organizations develop sensitivity around self and other 
other awareness. This will help to create the right context for dealing with children intelligent leaders should be created. This will enable top management to have necessary commitment to emotional intelligence. Management should, as, as much as possible, avoid the leadership trap. The tendency to overvalue certain traits and skills while they're looking some other attributes. Thus, making them to select also implementers are needed in today's globalized world. Managers should encourage their subordinates to develop the culture of questioning assumptions and thinking about the future. They should not avoid the sources of innovation to create new ideas, new processes, and new man-made skills. We're in to 2002, page 110. Effective leaders are needed. The use of consultants should be discouraged as these crops are only interested in raking in household profit. Rather, they need to look inward, especially where such capabilities exist. Advertising should be encouraged as the long-term effect is inestimable. A practice of using outsiders to see students for admission in private institutions where money may already has invested in communication equipment and have an existing skill set is not desirable as it's a pipeline for the waste of scarce resources for such institutions. There is need to subordinate personal interest to original interest. Whenever there is a conflict between personal interest and original interest, original interest should prevail. This should act as a constraint on the extent to which we allow our interests and preferences to override national or organizational interests. It is my view that any individual who overvalues his interest more than the organizational interest should resign. Although most management firms are no more trending and in fashion, there are still many benefits from misuse in order to have competitive advantage, which is sustainable. The neglect of these facts may be detrimental to the success of businesses. Management must select from a portfolio of techniques which have become facts in order to gain sustainable competitive advantage. Since there are still so much to be derived from facts, management should not jettison them, but selectively adopt them if they want to be competitive. Management must endeavor to shift from red ocean to blue ocean so that they will avoid the whales that will destroy them in the sea. So you must shift to the blue ocean where you will have relative peace. You will not have foes. In order to beat competition, every company should innovate continuously and constantly. It should venture into a time market space and stop to compete with others. The company should create demand and pro provide unprecedented value for customers. Acknowledgements. First and foremost, my appreciation goes to God Almighty, who has made it possible for me to present this inaugural lecture. Without good health, I will not be standing here today to deliver this lecture. His name be praised. I'm grateful to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Sam Wobadia, for providing a conducive environment for creativity and through whom I learned to be emotionally intelligent. It is in your, in your time. It is in your time that the inaugural lecture has assumed a new dimension in Bensi Dawson University. Thank you for this great teach. My special appreciation goes to the president of BIU, Bishop Feb Idaosa, and vice president of BIU, Professor John Okoya, who was instrumental to my employment in BIU. As well, I express my profound gratitude to the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor John C. O. Oyedeji, the Registrar, Mr. Vinti Itoya, and the Bossa, Dr. Dr. Gladde Iguabara, and the Active University Liberia, Mrs. Rosemary Odiachi. I have so much to say about this management people, but I will not say anything because time is not on my side. Right. I'm deeply indebted to my late father, Mr. Joseph Ilari Oyorenoya, and 
And my mother, Mrs. is is enable Oseke Oyorinoya. I'm also thankful to my siblings, Reverend Dr. Michael A. Oyorinoya, Mr. Victor I. Oyorinoya, Mr. Godwin Oyorinoya, and to Mr. Femony Oyorinoya, Mr. Paul Oyorinoya, Mr. Vincent Oyorinoya, of blessed memories. To my mother-in-law, Mrs. Vida Akumedae, and brother-in-laws, Mr. Kenneth Akumedae, Ejina Ochuku Akumedae, Mr. Ogenevo Akumedae, for the various roles they have played in my life. My deepest appreciation goes to Mr. Udukwe, AK of Nile University, Abuja, and Mr. Olaika Owulabi of Bensidasa University. They supplied all the library resources that I needed for this lecture. And Dr. Eliaza Chibuzo Bandi, his family, for their support and encouragement throughout the 10 years I spent as HOD. I thank you very much, Mandy. My special appreciation goes to Professor Clara Igeleke for her standing and for her understanding and propping me up for the presentation with materials to assist me and Professor Nora Omorege. I thank Professor Eriki for his role in my brain stint in the University of Benin. And he made sure I came back to continue my PhD. Which, again, human factor did not, <laughs> did not allow me to complete. You have been a brother to me. My thanks to Professor Bamidele Sani, my mentor. <laughs> Professor Abdul. Abu Lime O Anao, Professor Ifeko Osawoye, who were Ifero, sorry, not Ifeko. Is Ifero Osawoye, who were my mentors and were always ready to give me advice whenever I needed it. I express my reserved and special gratitude to all the past vice chancellors of BIU and I have that I have opportunity to work with. Professor Ego Osage, Professor G. Omuta, Professor McDonald Idu, and Professor Ernest Izedige. I appreciate all the past deans in my faculty, Professor Andrew Oronsaye, who also is my mentor, was, was and is still my mentor till today. Late, <laughs> late Professor Friday Ohimai Eboreme, whose leadership style inflamed me so much, and Professor Okonti Ekanem of Blessed Memory, Professor N.J. Mwambuza, Professor Ruth Uroide, and the current dean, Professor Godwin O.E. Obu. I had written something before I had to cancel it because no time. My special appreciation goes to all staff of the Department of Business Administration, Dr. Samuel Adedoi, Dr. Michael Osamuji, Dr. Ernest Amien, Dr. Sandra Ajay, late Mrs. Deborah Desmond, Dr. Sylvester Opobroku, Dr. Victor Alaba, Mr. Pascal Wokike, and Prez Okungboa, all my former departmental secretary, Mrs. Lilian Ehigiato, Mrs. A.K., and Mrs. Vera, they are all acknowledged. I appreciate Professor Festus I.O. Yai, Professor Bass Aboifo, Professor Anthony, you in every neighbor of blessed memories, who were very dear to me and contributed immensely to my academy. Professor Yai was my thesis supervisor. It was from his mouth I knew that there is what you call C of O. He said, John, you have C of O over me? <laughs> because I put so much pressure on him that he had, to, he had no other thing that to say. Please, he, he spoke to Babs. He said, Bab, a boy who has John, does John have C of O over me? I never forget that statement, but they are late now. I appreciate, I especially thank the following for support and encouragement. Professor Frederick Omohebe Joseph Obo, Professor Mark Igile, My, Professor Mike Asekome, Professor Patrick Osawoyi, Obiasui, 
Professor Rosemary Obasi, Dr. Moses Eri, Dr. Orobosa Iheseke, and others of SMS family whose names may have been skipped, but are very dear to me. I acknowledge all my post students, past and present, all my friends, and my other colleagues whose names are too numerous to mention in this brief lecture. I thank everyone in the audience today who took off their busy schedule to come to listen to my lecture. God bless you. Finally, my wife. My wife. If, if I had to marry again and again and again, I would marry her. <laughs> He will tell me, see, we must achieve this. And he will be the one who will lead. You see, people see us, they will say, ah, this woman is the one who is leading. When you see a woman who does, who can do everything better than you, what do you do? You watch him, you watch her. <laughs> She's wonderful. She's wonderful. She's Thank wonderful. You. Together, we raised our children who have been a blessing to us. I love you, my darling, who is now my mom. So, my children, you know, Timothy Osarame, Oyoroya. Susanna Ohige Ohiondua and Eugene Daniel Ohiondua, I bless you all. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Professor John Ohiondua, the 20th inaugural lecturer of Bensi Dahosa University. Thank you very much. Once more, a round of applause for the lecturer. You may be seated, please. The last but one lecturer was the dancing etymologist. The last lecturer was the comrade professor. And now we have the laughing professor. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to recognize the presence of the representative of the vice chancellor of Wellspring University, Benin City. Professor Okbara Eina, you're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. We're glad to have you. I'd like to recognize the head of Department of Marketing, University of Benin, Professor Mrs. Edith Odia. You're welcome, madam. Thank you for being here. From Ambrose Ali University, Ekboma, Dr. Julius Iharehon. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. From the University of Benin, a professor of finance, Professor S.O. Igbinosa. You're welcome, sir. Okay. The Chairman, Police Community Relations Committee, Ubo, Benin City, Mr. Ikena Francis. You're welcome, sir. Now we know that we are very safe in this hall. Thank you, sir. We have a member of the Mountain of Fire and Miracles Ministries, Mrs. Ehenya, and other members of the church, you're welcome. 
Thank you very much. I have here the Director of Academic Planning of Bensi Dahosa University, Professor Rosemary Obasi. You are welcome. We also have Professor Ruth Uroide. You are welcome, ma'am. Please, if I do not recognize you, don't take it to heart. It is the human factor. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to receive to the podium the Vice Chancellor of this university for the synopsis of the lecture. Thank you, Registrar. The laughing professor. We want to join our inaugural lecture to appreciate the wife. Madam, we appreciate you. Evangelist Mrs. Dorothy O'Hare Noya. We thank you for taking care of our professors. We also thank our, our mentors. You know, he mentors and mentors. They are here seated. We want to thank you for the mentoring. Please don't stop to mentor this laughing professor. Thank you very much. Just a brief synopsis of what we have heard today. In the lecture, the uh, professor examined the role of the human factor in management and its past and believed that human factor is very critical in managing and in determining management part. The register has just made mention of one human factor now. That's to say, what we can talk about management fact is not only in government, it's also in academic, it's also in our homes, it's in the church. But how we respond to such situation is what our lecturer is telling us today. Say so management facts are likely to remain as long as managerial issues continue to steer organizations in the face and different organizational problems and opportunities are experienced. But he said, so long our personal values, preference, and interests do not cause catastrophic failure to our organization, so long we do allow the human factor, the decision maker should weigh his or her values, his preference, and interests against On behalf of the, bank, the chancellor, the president, by Chancellor and Management of this university, I hereby admit you to the group of senior professors of this university. Please turn off the music, please. Thank you very much. Big, big congratulations to you, Professor Ohir Noya. You have today been inducted into the eminent elite group of senior professors of Bensi Dahosa University. The likes of Professor Obo, Professor Mark Igile will no longer bully you. You have now, yes, thank you very much. Big congratulations. Principal officers, please join the photograph. Principal officers. All past inaugural lecturers. Professor Nora Morege, Professor Lei Boy Geleke, Professor Hiarekian Obo, Professor Fred Obo, Professor Ronsaye is here with us today. Professor Ronsaye, please join Professor Ekrakene, the dancing etymologist. Please join. This is an elite group of senior professors of this university. Emmy professors of this university. Hold on, please, hold on. Some are still coming. Eminent professors of this university. Congratulations to you all. 
There are many more on the way. Many, many more. We are very busy at Bessie Dahosa University. Yes. I like to recognize the presence of Engineer Chief Ademolu Israel. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and management, I'd like to thank you all for being here. And we look forward to seeing you again here soon when we take our 21st inaugural lecture. Please, there is enough refreshment to go around. And if you don't get any, please don't go to court. It is the human factor. Ladies and gentlemen, may we all rise as we take the closing prayer. I have the singular honor to invite to the podium Professor Godwin Ehiarehia Obo to take the closing prayer. Praise the Lord. Please, let's bow our head as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you for today's inaugural lecture. We want to thank you for your presence. We want to thank you for your son, Professor John Horanoya, for the successful presentation of his inaugural lecture. We return all the glory unto you in the name of Jesus. By this series of inaugural lectures, we know you are opening a new space creating visibility for this university and it will lead to the growth and development of this university in the name of Jesus. We commit everyone and made it to this occasion to deal into your hands that as you go back, the presence of God will go with you. You left some things at home. We wouldn't know the situation at home before you came here. But we want to assure you by the grace of God that when you will arrive, you will discover that God has perfected everything that concerns you in the name of Jesus. You came here to celebrate with us today. Soon, there will be something to celebrate in your life. Thank you, Father, because we know you heard and you have equally answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please remain standing. Be a you, Anton. Be you the fruit of faith, thy fame spread far and wide. With hearts of joy, we sing of thee. Sound firm in truth and honesty. Gold and white for excellence, academics with godliness, building leaders all in faith for all endeavors the future holds forward we go in good faith god is our help our guide we shall never fail forward we go in good faith God is our help, our guide, we shall never fail. Oh, amen, amen, amen. Oh,
so compatriot, Nigeria's call obey to serve our fatherland with love and strength and faith. The Shall never be in vain to serve with heart and mind, one nation bound in freedom, peace, and unity. Hello, please. Can you please remain where you are while the VC procession leaves the chapel? Please remain where you are until the procession leaves the auditorium. Please remain where you are.